<laughs> and thank you all for coming. Um, I've always supported George and Heather's project and had the utmost faith in their innovative experiment to engage in vertical readings of dentist comedy. But I have to admit that when George first asked me to do the 18s, I felt a bit worried. The images I initially recalled from each contour were rather different. While in Inferno 18, Dante encounters the panders and seducers, as well as the flatterers, one of whom was a prostitute immersed in excrement. In Purgatorio 18, Virgil finishes his discourse on love according to reason. He explains that Beatrice will have to take over for matters of faith. And the pilgrim encounters the slothful hurrying around correcting their vice while calling out exemplar of zeal and sloth. In Paradiso 18, Dante and Beatrice travel from the heaven of Mars to the heaven of Jupiter, witnessing what has been called by one critic one of the most beautiful yet neglected images in the canticle, and which is certainly one of the more complex, the transformation of the singing and dancing souls of the blessed um, appearing as lights and forming an M that sprouts a lily and turns into the shape of an eagle. So it's rather complex, but um, we'll talk about that later. If you're asking yourself now, what have sex, feces, pardon my language, but Dante uses rather more vulgar language himself, and seduction in Inferno 18 have to do with love and sloth in purgatory and with song and justice in paradise. You know how I felt when I first started doing research on the 18th. Um, and just as an aside, the books I started bringing home doing my initial research seemed to re reinforce my doubts. Um, excrement in the Middle Ages, on farting, language and laughter in the Middle Ages. That was actually a really good book. <laughs> but when I took it out from the library, the, the students checking it out were really really looking at me like I was crazy. Um, and, you know, books, such different kinds of books, such as, you know, on sex and violence, um, books on the image of the eagle in Dante's works, on love and justice, they all seemed quite different. But at least seeing them all in one place reminded me that Dante's works do indeed deserve to be characterized as plurilingual, encyclopedic, and daringly syncretistic, as many scholars have argued over the years, and as I'm sure has become apparent over the course of this lecture series. However, as many scholars have pointed out, Dante's syncretism is not an excuse for sloppiness. To use an elementary metaphor in anticipation of what's to come, I mean this both in the sense of my lecture and in hopefully your plans for dinner this evening, um, the comedy is not something, some delicious mess of everything one finds in one's fridge in whatever measure one finds them. Rather, it is a very careful mixing together of parts, of high and low styles of subject matter traditionally seem to be proper only to one style, of Christian theological authorities with classical pagan ones. In other words, precisely because of its, at times, overwhelming plurilingualism, diversity of topics and scope of meanings, we are invited to read the comedy with the utmost care and attention to detail. Thus, despite my initial misgivings, I began to find a number of parallels between the three contos, some more deserving than others of interpretation and further investigation, but all of them interesting and challenging to my own previous methods of interpretation. Um, just a note on my methods, they were a bit obsessive. <laughs> Given the unprecedented nature of this endeavor, I attempted to compare as much as I possibly could from each canto. So including theme, image, rhyme, source texts, individual words. And obviously we won't have time to talk about all these and they're not all relevant, but um, just a note on how experimental this method is and how it's rewarding it, it can be in the future. Um, so what I discovered was rather a mixed bag. Some parallels were so obvious and endemic to the whole comedy that is, I wasn't sure they counted. For instance, the issues of love, language, and the comedy's own relationship to its source, source texts, especially the Bible and the classical tradition. Yet, I'm going to talk about some of these today anyway, for even if some of these issues are key to the comedy as a whole, that doesn't preclude them from being important when read across canticles, obviously. Conversely, some parallels were so detailed that they seemed either to be the result of chance and or to be without implications of wider importance to the comedy as a whole. And this happened especially with structural patterns and with lexical repetitions. So for instance, um, I found that Dante uses the verb vanagiare twice in Inferno 18, once in Purgatorio 18, and only three times in the whole rest of the comedy. But I'm not sure that that is significant yet. Um, so, and that sort of happened a lot in the course of my research. But I think maybe some of you doing research might, might find that some of those do have um, importance. During my research, um, I began to feel rather seduced by the temptation to overanalyze these three canto cantos. And when I say seduced, I mean that in its full sense, that I was constantly aware of how pleasurable it is to find meaning and patterns, and at the same time, fearful that I could be led astray. And this is, of course, appropriate because 
one of the sins punished in Inferno 18 is seduction. In fact, several aspects of the cantos themselves encouraged me to read vertically. Thus, I think these bear mentioning. Firstly, all three of these cantos are preoccupied with structure in their own way. Purgatorio 18, in particular, has generated much criticism about Dante's use of structure and the structure of the comedy as a whole, as it forms part of a group of central cant cantos of the canticle, where Virgil expounds on the nature of love. As you may have learned from Tristan Kay's lecture last time, um, the way in which Virgil defines love establishes the foundation for the structure of Purgatory's very topographical and moral order. Um, and this is from Purgatory 17. Quin ci comprender poi che esser convene amor semente in voi d'ogni virtute e d'ogni operazione che merte pene. Um, three, times of, three types of faulty love define the classifications of vices in purgatory. The first category is misdirected or perverted love, directed towards harming others, pride, envy, and wrath, which are purged on the first three terraces. The second category is insufficient love, specifically the vice of sloth or achidia, which is purged in the fourth terrace and is described in our conjo Purgatorio 18. The third category is excessive or disordered love of necessary goods, covetousness, gluttony, and lust. Thus, the fourth terrace of sloth in Purgatory 18 holds the central position in the schema of the typology of vices. In addition, Singleton has found in these central contours in Purgatorio, and also of the comedy as a whole, a fixation on the number seven, enforced by a complex symmetry of numbers at the level of verse and terzine. So if one, this is uh, on the slide, oh, sorry, I forgot how to, okay. <laughs> um, if one counts the number of lines in each of the central seven cantos, so from Purgatory 14 to Purgatory 20, um, one finds the chiasmus. So there's 151 lines in Purgatory 14 and 151 in Purgatory 20. So there's a symmetry there that Singleton points out. Um, in addition to the obvious Trinitarian implications of the central canto here, which has one through nine, uh, lines, Singleton calls attention to various ways in which the number seven features prominently as well. Each, in the framing, each of the framing contours, 14 and 20, have 151 lines, and 1 plus 5 plus 1 equals 7. In addition, this is Singleton's method, um, which I think is compelling. In addition, counting 25 terzine into Purgatorio 18 from the end of Purgatorio 17 we come precisely to the end of Virgil's discourse on love, the second half of which dealt specifically with the role of free will. Counting backwards 25 Chetzine from the beginning of Purgatory 17, we come to line 70 of Purgatory 16, where Marco Lombardo begins his discourse on free will. Um, and this is quote one on your handout. Um, Voi che vivete ogni cagion recate por suso al cielo, fur come se tutto movesse secco di necessitate, se così fosse, in voi for distrutto libero arbitrio, e non for giustizia per ben letizia, ma per male aver luto. So, in short, the issue of free will frames the central contours of the commedia as a whole, if we look at its position numerically within the poem. 25 terzine is also significant in Singleton's opinion, since, of course, 2 plus 5 equals 7. Singleton sees in these central seven cantos what he calls Dante's signature, and he finds the number significant for several reasons, including its association with the days of creation. And as Tristan mentioned last time as well, 7 is also the number of the capital vices and virtues, the planets, the ecclesiastical orders, the sacraments, and the liberal arts. A, ver a number of very important points could be made here. But for our purposes, I just want to make the very simple point that the meaning of the text, specifically its ethical message, is, intrinsically, is intricately enmeshed with its structure and its numerical ordering. As Singleton suggests, the only way we could find out this structural symmetry would be by counting verses in terzine. Hence, it would seem that Dante is encouraging us as readers to, be, to, to engage in this kind of numerical attention. Um, in Paradiso 18, Dante does just that. He counts the letters written in the sky by the souls of the blessed. This is your quote, too, on your handout. Um, and again, as in, as in Singleton's reading of Portugal 18, here again we find the number seven. So, Mostrarsi dunque in cinque volte sette, vocali e consonanti, 
e io notai le parti sì, come mi parve dette diligite justitiam primai, for verbo e nome di tutto il dipinto, qui giudicati serram, for sezzai. Poscia nell'emme del vocabol quinto rimasere ordinate, sì che Giove pareva argento lì giorno distinto, e vidi scendere altre luci dove era il colmo dell'emme, e lì quetarsi cantando, credo, il ben passè le move. Hence, and you'll see from this quote, my temptation to call this lecture in honor of Sesame Street, brought to you by the letter M in the number 18, <laughs> which was held in check by my trusted counselors who reminded me that Sesame Street is perhaps not such a thing over here, or maybe that's because it's not the 80s anymore. <laughs> um, so to return to Paradiso 18, perhaps swept away, um, carried off like some of the people um, seduced in Inferno 18, um, by Dante's apparent encouragement to start counting letters, and by his mention of vowels and consonants, I counted those in this in the saying, de le dite justitiam, and, fa and found um, 18 vowels and 17 consonants. It, I'm not sure this is significant, um, but we are in the 18th canto, and I'm just, my point is that something about, at least in these two cantos, Progetto 18 and Paradiso 18, we're being perhaps invited to, to count letters or words or verses in the case of Singleton's example. Why does Dante emphasize the interrelation of number with letter in Paradiso 18? I think we might find one clue in the actions of the souls of the blessed in this canto. When Dante and Beatrice ascend to the heaven of Jupiter, they hear the souls singing and see them dancing to their own music. And this is um, quote three on your hand right. E come al gelli surti di rivera, quasi congratulando a lor pasture, Fanno di sé or tonda or altra schiera. Si dentro ai lumi sante creature volitando cantavano e facian si or di or i or elle in sue figure. Prima cantando a sua notte movienzi, poi diventando lum di questi segni, un poco s'arrestavano e tacienzi. If I may be permitted a rather reductive equivocation, music is number we find in song itself an interweaving of the numerical and the linguistic. The souls in Paradiso 18 therefore dance and sing, and sing a performance of the connectedness of word and number, of thematic meaning and structure that we're looking for in our project of reading Dante's comedy through an attention to the number of each canto. Thus, Paradiso's 18's thematization of the interaction between letter and number alone would justify our pursuit of vertical readings. This, plus the intricate structural symmetries of the central contours of Purgatorio, as we've seen, strengthen that inclination, and hopefully some of the parallels we'll see today will further strengthen it. I'm going to begin with a brief account of each canto, um, laying out the narrative structure and mentioning some issues that have been of particular interest in criticism. Um, Inferno 18 opens with a description of the architecture of the eighth circle of hell, the ten malavolger evil pouches in which the fraudulent are punished for various sins relating to deception. Each of the, um, uh, each of the sins of fraud are punished in each of the volge. Um, this is quote four. Luogo è in inferno detto male volge, tutto di pietra di color ferigno come la cerchia che dintorno il volge. Oh, and I should mention that um, all these uh, uh, translations of Robert Kirkpatrick's. Um, the infernal architecture of the Malabolge is described in much detail and with some recourse to what we might call defensive imagery. Castles, moats, walls, bridges, etc. And this is also in quote four. Um, and I would say, whereas people inside a castle might feel protected by their communities, here it will become apparent that the souls in hell are trapped by the Malabolge um, in a perversion of what community is meant to be. So, um, this is your next quote, which, um, quote four, which I think I won't read because we just have it there and we'll come back to it. Um, similarly, scholars have posited that the structure of hell is analogous to the body of Satan and that the Malabolge specifically are like Satan's intestines. Thus, in addition to being trapped in descending rings of hell that parody the protective moats of the city, the souls are trapped in an image of Satan's very body. They are trapped in a perverted body politic as well as in a, the perverted body of Satan. This accords with Dante's conception of the infernal order of hell, since crimes of fraud or deceit damage the body politic, 
because they erode trust between citizens. In, uh, in Ferrante's words, fraud is the sin most harmful to society because it destroys the faith among men on which social order must rest. Following the description of the structure of the Malabolge, Inferno 18 goes on to narrate Dante and Virgil's progress as they walk through the first two Bolge, where they see new kinds of torments, fresh suffering, new whips, new tortures, as Robin's um, phrase, nova pieta, nova tormento, novi frustatori. They find in the first Bolge the panders and the seducers who are naked and whipped by demons and walk in opposite directions facing each other in a way that reminds Dante of the pilgrims crossing the Ponte degli Angeli on their way to and from St. Peter's during the first jubilee of 1300. Um, the papal bull issued by Boniface VIII granted indulgences to all those who visited the Basilica of San Pietro and San Paolo Fuori le Mura on certain days of the year. Among the panders, Dandy recognizes Venedico Caccianemico, a Bolognese nobleman who gained the Marquis d'Este access to the bedchamber of his sister, Gisola Bella, in exchange for money. Among the seducers, Dante recognizes Jason, who abandoned Hypsipyle, Queen of Lemnos, while she was pregnant, and later abandoned his wife, Medea, for yet another woman. In the second Bolge in Inferno 18, um, and I should mention this is the only canto of the Mela Bolge that contains two Bolge in one canto, Dante and Virgil see the flatterers immersed in human excrement. Dante recognizes Alessio and Terminé of Luca beating his head, his hair so wet with excrement that one could not tell whether he was layman or cleric, and Thais, a prostitute who, in Dante's misunderstanding of Cicero quoting Terence, flattered her lover with false praise. And this is quote five. Fa che pinghe disse il viso un poco più avante, si che la faccia ben con l'occhio attinge di quella sozza e scapigliata fante, che la si grafia con lunghe merdose e or sa coscia e or è in piedi sante. Teide è la puttana che rispose al drudo suo quando disse O oh io grazie con eh, O oh io grazie grandi a te, anzi meravigliose, e quinci siano le nostre viste sazie. The low content of this quanto subject matter um, excrement, prostitution, its use of elementary metaphors, as well as the fact that one of Dante's sources for the character Thais is a comedy by Terence, have often led critics to characterize it as adhering to the low or comic style. But this has recently been refuted by Sigmund Bransky in an article arguing that Dante's treatment of shit and the sin of flattery is in fact prudent and ethical, as it follows a tradition of the sins of the tongue, as well as a biblical exegetical tradition in which the bodies of prostitutes are often associated with excrement. And I agree with him. However, whereas in many of the biblical passages cited by Bransky, the prostitute's body is sent, said to mingle with dung, Dante is careful in his passage to emphasize Thais's humanity, um, uh, the, actually the humanity of the excrement itself. It's, it's from human privies. Um, in his use of the word fante to describe Thais, meaning in this sense prostitute, but which can have the connotation of servant or child, we are reminded of another use of fante, which Statius uses in Purgatorio 25 to describe the human being at the moment he or she becomes human and gains the capacity for speech and reasoning. Statius describes come d'animal di venia fante by recounting the moment when God breathes the rational soul into the fetus's brain during the process of human conception. By using fante to describe taste in this context, Dante reminds us that the fraudulent engage in the calculated misuse of reason, which was given to them by God and which constituted their very humanity. Thus, Thais alternates between squatting like an animal and standing up straight while covered in specifically human excrement. If you'll remember, Dante takes care to mention where the excrement come from, comes from. This is quote five. Um, he says it as if it came from umani privati, in quote five. Um, so in this way, the reader is reminded that language is a specifically human gift from God. To waste it debases us and makes us, in a sense, worse than animals because at least animals are fulfilling their proper place in the world where we're, we're perverting ours. Superficially, excrement is an appropriate symbol for the words wasted on undeserving objects of praise, since excrement is waste. And this equivocation, I'm sure, informs the contrapasso. But the metaphor extends even more deeply as well. 
If feces is a symbol for flattery, and the opposite of feces is nourishment, the food that instead of getting wasted is digested properly and absorbed into the body as nutrients, then we might expect Dante to associate food with knowledge, eating with listening, digesting with remembering. And this is indeed exactly what he does throughout the comedy and in several other works. And though we don't exactly have time to go into this properly now, there has been much work done on this. And, and to give one example, um, the convivio repeatedly refers to the crumbs of knowledge falling from the table philosophy. Furthermore, in Dante's conception, nutrients not used by our limbs and organs get further digested into reproductive fluid, eventually mixing together to form the fetus during the process of human conception, which Dante compares explicitly to the process of creating a work of art. Thus, eating the fruit of knowledge and digesting it properly not only nourishes one's mind, but if one uses properly the knowledge that one absorbs, it also has the capacity to be generative and therefore to nourish the minds of others. Thus, it is quite significant in my mind that Thais is a flatterer and a prostitute and that she is covered in excrement. Wasting words is wasting an opportunity to generate meaning, to impart knowledge to others. Indeed, the emphasis on excrement, its associations with language, and with the uniquely human capacity for language may help to explain the relatively large quantity of elementary metaphors we find in Inferno 18. Um, and some of these, I'll just list some of these. When Dante first spots the Nendico Caccianemico, he says to Virgil, Già di veder costui non son di giorno. In other words, I've seen him before, and I wouldn't fast for him. Dante asks Venedico to bring uh, him down here to stew in these pungenti salse. And uh, Virgil, at the end of the canto, says he hopes that their gazes have been satisfied, le viste sazie. And the flatterers make sounds that Dante describes with the verb scufare, which, according to an early commentator, connotes the sound made by pigs while eating. And we'll also find some uh, elementary metaphors in some of our other contos today when we get to them. So just briefly to sum up our little mini-reading of Inferno 18. First, the canto marks a structural turning point. It introduces the A circle of fraud that Dante and Virgil have just entered, where they will see new kinds of torments. Second, integral to this canto is the idea that language is uniquely human and that fraud is a calculated corruption of that divine gift. Third, less explicit in the canto, but I think quite important, and we'll come back to this, is the canto's emphasis on the human body, and in particular, the female body in its relationship to fertility and sexuality. The female figures in this canto, Thais, Gisola Bella, Medea, and Hypsipyle are associated with sex or pregnancy to varying levels of blame. Hypsipyle is presented as, represented as more innocent. She's left pregnant and alone, and Dante uses the diminutive soletta, which makes her seem young and small. While Medea, on the other hand, took revenge on Jason by killing their children. Gisola Bella is portrayed as a victim as well, whereas Thais is portrayed in a negative light. All three forms of fraud mentioned here pandering, seducing, and flattery are associated with sex in the canto. While pandering and seducing involve sex explicitly, Dante situates the sin of flattery within a sexual scenario. Thais's insincere words of praise are uttered to her lover, presumably in reference to her lover's performance in bed. Fourth, the elementary metaphors in the canto remind the reader not only of the animal part of human nature, but also they tend to draw the reader's attention to the issue of hunger, and in this case, they might relate to the theme of greed, which looks in the background of many of the sins punished here. For instance, Venedico uh, Cacinemico gave his own sister to the Marquis for money, till he sold her body, this kind of a subtext of, of greed and money. These four points about Inferno 18 will be useful to keep in mind as we proceed to the other contos. Um, Purgatorio 18 opens with the second half of Virgil's exposition on the nature of love, which began in the previous canto. Here, Dante asks Virgil to explain further how love is the seed of all good and bad acts, as he mentioned before. And Virgil answers with an explanation of the nature of free will. Virgil agrees to tell Dante about love in terms of what he can know, um, and according to reason, and Beatrice will take over according to faith. And this is quote six um, in your handout, which I'll just let you read. Thus, the canto sets up an important distinction between Dante's two guides, one pagan and one Christian, causing the reader both to look back at Dante's journey up to this point and to look ahead towards what is to come in Paradise. And this is maybe one way in which we can see Purgatory 18 and Inferno 18 have a structural 
important role structurally. In the middle of the canto, Dante sees the moon, which he describes as formed like a copper bucket, burnished red. Um, uh, la luna quasi a mezzanotte tarda face le stelle a noi parer più rade fatta come un secchion che tutto, tutto arda. Dante and Virgil then encounter the slothful souls, scourging their vice by running continuously and calling out examples of sloth and its corrective zeal. Um, and they, they shout out, Maria corse con fretta la montagna. Mary hastened up to Judas Hill. And this is in reference to Mary's haste when she ran to tell Elizabeth the news of her pregnancy. At the end of the canto, Dante falls asleep, and in the next canto we'll have a dream of the femina balba, or the siren, who may represent a kind of intellectual temptation. And I think there might be some really interesting parallels with that as well, but I won't go into them because it's 19. I'm trying to be very strict about the numbers. <laughs> so the language of Purgatorio 18 has been characterized as scholastic, and it does feel in some ways formal. Technical words like form, act, virtue, principle, reasoning, and so forth abound. So that some have even remarked that the language is so rational that it seemed removed from the war warmth usually involved in love itself. I think that this is in fact to miss the point in several ways though. First, for Dante, as we have seen in the negative examples in Inferno 18, and in positive examples in Purgatory 18, reasoning and love are intricately connected. And second, some of the most memorable images of the canto relate to natural imagery that connotes fertility. And here I'm very much indebted to Beatrice Priest, um, who just finished a PhD on fertility in Dante, which has been really formative for me, not just for this lecture, but um, for my other research. So the language in this is in canto is, um, despite being technical and Aristotelian, is anything but sterile. For instance, we see images related to nature and fertility in lines uh, 52 through 4, this is quote 6. Um, La qual sans operar non è sentita, né si dimostra mai che per effetto, come per veri fronde in pianta vita. And in lines 103 through 105, we have another reference to green. The slothful shout while they run, ratto, ratto, che il tempo non si perda, per poco amor, gridavano gli altri appreso. Che studio di ben far grazia rinverda. Virgil also uses imagery that recalls harvesting and processes, processing grain. So this is in quote seven. Queste um, il principio la onde si piglia, ragion di meritare in voi, secondo che buoni e re amor accoglie e vivia. And we find another reference to food and the fertility of nature in lines 58, when Virgil describes natural love with the image of the bee's inclination to make honey. Però la onde ve gran lo intelletto delle prime notizie, omo non sape, e dei primi affettibili l'affetto, che sono in voi, sì come studio in arte, di farlo mele, e questa prima voglia, metro di lode, o di biasmo non cape. In addition to Virgil's perhaps pastoral references, he also uses language that relates to Dante's portrayals elsewhere of human reproduction. For instance, the language of the wax or matera, which is informed by an imprint or semio that we find in quote eight. Or ti puote apparar, apparer, quante nascosa la veritate alla gente, caverra ciascun amore in se, la rapide cose. Però che forse a far la sua matera, sempre esser buona, ma non ciascun segno è buono, ancor che buona sia la cera. And here I would like just to briefly mention that we might perhaps compare Virgil's two references to praise here, as well as his emphasis on the issue of truth. He mentions truth in line 35, 7, 22, and lying in line 109 of Purgatory 18, with Inferno 18's condemnation of insincere or excessive praise in the form of flattery. Warmth is often associated with processes of reproduction in medieval physiological thought, Hence, we might also see the numerous images to kindling and flames as contributing to the imagery of fertility in Purgatorio 18 as well. And we find in this canto fertile images that have to do specifically with language, thought, and reasoning. For instance, Dante's doubt or question about love is described as pregnant in quote eight. And I'll just leave that one for you to look at. Um, 
Virgil explains how minds pass or enter into desire in a way analogous to fire moving upwards, which is, by virtue of its form, born to rise where it may as matter most endure. And that's Robin's uh, translation as well. And at the end of the canto, new thoughts are born in Dante's mind. And this is quote nine. Poi quando fuor da noi tanto divise quell'ombre che veder più non potersi, novo pensiero dentro a me si mise, del qual più altri nacchero e diversi. A final image to do with fertility may be found at a metatextual level. The slothful in this terrace shout exempla of zeal, one of which is military and Roman, Cesare per soggiogare l'erda, punse marsidia e porcorsi in Spagna, and one of which is Christian, as we've seen Maria ran with um, her to the mountain. Thus, here again, Dante associates fertility with language, Mary, newly pregnant with Christ, running to tell Elizabeth the news. Thus, in Purgatorio 18, the issues of language, love, and the proper ordering of desire, and the human capacity for reason, reasoning, are intricately connected. Something similar might be said about the issue of language in Ferno 18, except we see there, instead, negative examples. Broken promises of love, pregnant women abandoned, the calculated abuse of language. In Inferno 18, as we saw, elementary metaphors were used ironically to emphasize contrast between the human and the animal, and um, we as humans uh, should use our unique powers of reasoning in the proper way, or else we become like these animals. In Purgatory 18, references to food were made in the context of images of natural fertility, bees being inclined to make honey, grain being gathered. So in short, in Inferno 18, words are associated with waste, Purgatory 18, language is associated with images of fertility and generation. While much more could be said about these parallels between Purgatory and Inferno 18, I want to jump ahead to Paradiso 18, so we can begin to compare some issues across all three. Several critics have remarked that Paradiso 18 has received less critical attention than it deserves, despite containing some of the most beautiful images in the entire canticle. And they suggest that this may be due in part to the canto's liminal position. It begins in the heaven of Mars at the end of Dante's encounter with Caccia Guida, where Dante's ancestor names various courageous souls, Joshua, Judas Maccabeus, Charlemagne, Roland, William, Reynold, Godfrey of Bouillon, Roberto Guiscardo, who move in a wheeling motion across uh, the cross of light. And this is quote 10. E al nome dell'alto Maccabeo vidi muoversi un altro roteando, e Letizia era ferza del paleo. They ascend to the heaven of Jupiter, Dante connoting the change of color from the red of Mars to the white of Jupiter with a simile of a blush of shame fading from a woman's cheek. Um, in Jupiter, Dante sees the lights of the souls of the blessed form the letters of a sentence from the Book of Wisdom of Solomon, which I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. Diligite justitiam qui judicatis terra, or love justice, you rulers of earth. The final letter of the sentence, the sparkling M of Terram, hovers in the air, which enlivies itself with thousands of lights that rise forth from the M and assume the form of an eagle, who, in the subsequent cantos, 19 and 20, goes on to speak about divine justice. So in here, I just I put a, a, a few images of um, how some people have imagined this transforming M. It's sort of a, a very, it's sort of a complicated image, I think, in a way. Um, and I apologize for the nature of my slides, which I just scanned from a book, but there are a few here. I hope the quality is okay. You see the eagle and the M. So. There's one more, I think. So, um, the canto may seem to be transitional for several reasons. Not only does it straddle the fifth and sixth heavens, Mars and Jupiter, but also it sets up the exposition on justice that will take up the next two cantos. The image of the canto are indeed extraordinarily beautiful. The souls of the blessed which appear to Dante as sparks of light alternate between movement and rest, singing and silence, throughout the canto, in an intricate, graceful kind of dance which accompanies the soul's own singing. They move in circles 
and other shapes as birds fly in the joy of having fed. And this is back to quote three, as we saw before. They alternate between singing and being silent. And this is quote 11. Prima cantando a sua nota movienti, poi diventando l'un di questi segni, un poco se restavano a tacienti. They ascend and descend, settling in the shapes of letters and rising up again. The lights descend in the M, settling there in lines 97 through 98, rise up again like sparks, rising from a burning log when struck, and then settle again to form the shape of the eagle. Just as in a dance done correctly, dancers move and are still, are not still at the proper time and in the proper place. While the lights move in an expression of freedom compared to birds flying joyfully through the air, they are also still at the appropriate times, settling into their proper places at the head of the eagle. And Dante says, e quietate, quietate ciascuna in suo loco. Thus, the choreography of this canto reflects how divine justice is, of course, balanced, ordered, and structured, while at the same time liberating. Beatrice and Dante, too, seem caught up in the dance, as a couple might respond to each other while dancing, following each other's gestures and facial expressions, Beatrice repeatedly directs Dante's gaze. She tells him, Volgiti e ascolta, in line 20, for instance. And Dante turns to her to search for clues in her <coughs> gestures. So in quote 12, Io mi rivolsi dal mio destro lato per vedere in Beatrice il mio dovere, o per parlare o per rato, segnato, e vide le sue luci tanto mere, tanto gioconde, che la sua sembianza vinceva gli altri e l'ultimo solere. The text repeatedly emphasizes faces. Um, I don't have all these quotes here, but the, it, it says the word face at least, you know, uh, different words for, the, for face in line 17, 22, 44, and 47. Um, Beatrice's smile in 19 and 56, and her eyes in 21 and 45. Perhaps also related to the dancing metaphor, and um, as you just mentioned earlier, in the um, we just had the workshop, and someone mentioned this, the beautiful point that um, re reading someone's face is also perhaps part of this response, being really attentive to be able to respond to gesture. Um, so perhaps also related to the dancing metaphor, there is throughout the canto also an emphasis on images of leading and following in lines 12 and 109, and even the shapes of letters that that the souls make alternate between movement and fixity in a kind of elegant dance. Now the lights form the sentence, love, justice, you rulers of, of earth. Then the final M lingers by itself. Then the M and lilies itself. Then it assumes the shape of an eagle. So the canto ends with an invective against Pope John II in his creed, um, who forgot the example of St. Peter and St. Paul, who nourished the vineyard of the church for their martyrdom. And this is quote 13. O milizia del ciel, qui io contemplo, adoro per color che sono intera. Tutti sviati dietro al mal d'esemplo, già si solea con le spade far guerra. Ma or si fa togliendo, or qui, or quivi, lo pan che il pio padre a nessun sera. Ma tu che sol per cancellare scrivi, pensa che Pietro e Carlo, che morirò per la vigna che guasti, ancor son vivi. A number of parallels between Paradiso 18 and the other two 18s may be noted, I believe. Firstly, the most obvious is love and its associations with language, which, as we have seen, are both of central concern in the other two contos. In Inferno 18, fraud is a calculated misuse of reason, as we saw. Flatterers use language specifically to commit their sin. And all of Dante's examples of sinners in Inferno 18 are implicated in situations where women's bodies are used for something other than for reproduction. In Purgatorio 18, Virgil expounds on the issue of love and its relationship to the human faculty of reason. In Paradiso 18, the letters in the sky spell out the dictum to love justice. L language is also thematized here, as well as love, since our attention is called to the miraculous method of writing these letters. In addition, the word diligere, which may mistranslates as, as love, is also associated with other meanings to choose and to write. Furthermore, the passage from the Book of Wisdom from which the dictum comes goes on to specify specifically linguistic concerns. This is also in your quote, uh, your handout in 14. I might just kind of say some of the English. Love justice, you, you that are the judges of the earth. 
um, for the spirit of wisdom is benevolent and will not equip the evil speaker from his lips. For God is witness of his reigns, and he is a true search of his heart, and a hearer of his tongue. For the spirit of the Lord hath filled the whole world, and that which contains all things hath knowledge of the voice. Therefore, he that speaketh unjust things cannot be hid, neither shall the chastising judgment pass him by. Um, hearing of his word shall come to God, uh, for the ear of jealousy heareth all things, and the tumult of murmuring shall not be hid. Keep yourself, therefore, from murmuring, which profiteth nothing, and refrain your tongue from detraction, for an obscure speech shall not go for naught, and the mouth of Elias killeth the soul. Thus, I just want to make this simple point that the issues of love and language are joined together in all three pontos, albeit in different ways. Secondly, love is also connected with the issue of justice in Paradiso 18, as, as it is to some extent as well in Purgatory 18, if you remember, where Virgil explains to Dante the role of free will in loving, in a speech that harkens back to Marco Lombardo's speech on free will that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, which explicitly connects it to the issue of justice. And that was on quote one. Thirdly, we find references to fertility in all of the contos. In Inferno 18, we saw that almost every woman mentioned was involved in some way in sexual situations that contrasted with fertile and productive ones. In Purgatory 18, we find references to green, plants, pregnancy, warmth, the wax and seal of creation. And in Paradiso 18, we find several references to plants as well. Um, L'albero che vive della cima e frutta sempre e mai non perde foglia. Um, I'm not sure if I put that one in the handout so I can read the English if that's helpful. The tree that thrives from summit down and bears constant fruit and never loses leaf. As well as the reference to Peter and Paul dying for the vigna of the church in line 132. So that's another um, image of a plant. Um, in addition to generative images being associated with language through all three 18s, the letter M in Paradiso 18 is itself generative as its tip sprouts into a lily. Fourthly, the issue of greed is found in Inferno and in Paradiso 18. The women's bodies referenced in Inferno 18 were sold for money. Um, and remember the, the quote, um, <clears throat> push off you pimp, there aren't any tarts down here for you to turn into cash. Um, Via Rufian qui non son femmini da conio. In Paradiso 18 as well, Dante accuses Pope John XXII of greed, as we saw in quote 13. Fifth, all three 18s refer to food, albeit in very different ways. Paradiso 18, as we have just seen above, accuses the Pope of waging war on the people by withholding bread from them instead of using swords. But food is also a cause of joy in Paradiso 18. Recall the image of the birds swirling in joy after feeding. In quote three, and the opening lines of the canto where Dante uses the metaphor of taste to describe the sweet and bitter taste of the news of his poetic destiny and his future exile, which was told to him in the previous canto de Pachaguida. And this is quote 15. Già si godeva solo del suo verbo, quel tuo specchio beato, e io gustavo lo mio, temprano col dolce e acerbo. In Purgatory 18, references to food are often associated with natural and fertile imagery. In the case of the bee's inclination to make honey, the reference is specifically about the desire to make food, which is like natural love. Whereas in Paradiso 18, food is withheld from people as a form of violence. In Inferno 18, references to food are associated with language, yet in usually a negative sense. Flattery is figured as waste, left over from undigested food and sinners make noises that animals may, might make while feeding. If we look at the trajectory of elementary metaphors across the 18s from all three canticles, we might place Purgatory 18 at the beginning of the sequence as it refers to the promise of food's creation, bees naturally desiring to make honey. Paradiso 18 refers to the withholding of food that has already been made or processed into bread. And Inferno 18 refers to food after it has been digested and in this case wasted. A sixth area of comparison may be found in Paradiso 18 and Inferno 18's use of martial or military imagery. As we saw already in quote 4, Inferno 18 describes the structure of the Malavolge in defensive images relating to fortresses and castles. Quale dove per guardia della mura, più e più fossi cingon di castelli, 
la parte dove sono grandi figure. Tale immagine qui vi faccio in quelli e come a tai fortezze, da loro sogli alla ripa di fuori sono ponticelli. Così da immo della roccia scogli, ma vien che rievien gli argini e fossi, infino al pozzo che i tronca e raccogli. Whereas in the first part of Paradiso 18, we are in the heaven of Mars. So um, predictably we see many examples of martial imagery including references in the examples of the courageous souls in the cross of light and to the Shavuot tradition of Christian knighthood, as well as two references to Beatrice conquering of Dante with her smile in lines 57 and 19. We also see martial imagery in the habit of Jupiter in Paradiso 18, where Dante refers to the Milizia da Cell, the wars once waged with swords, um, which are now waged with a snatching of bread, as well as repeated references to martyrdom in 123 and 135. A seventh area in which there exist parallels between Paradiso 18 and, and Fragno 18 may be found in the Canto's use of specific words. So Paradiso 18 repeatedly uses words related to miracles, miracol in 63, mirare at 34, rimiri at 113. While by contrast, Thais's sin consisted in her using the related word maravigliose to flatter her lover when he asks if she finds favor with him. Also, whips are mentioned in both Paradiso perhaps surprisingly, and Inferno 18. In Paradiso 18, the wheeling lights of the courageous are described as whipped around by happiness, as we saw in quote 10. And in Inferno 18, the devils whip the heels of the panders and the seducers as they walk. Finally, we might see a parallel, or this might be a stretch, but I'm going to say it in the spirit of experimentation, between Paradiso 18's mention of St. Paul and St. Peter, que morirò per la vigna, to which Pope the John II, the 22nd, 22nd late waste, and the reference in Inferno 18 to the pilgrims crossing the bridge during the first jubilee on the way to the basilicas of St. Peter and St. Paul of Fuori de Mura that was used in Inferno 18 as a simile to describe how the panders and seducers pass each other walking along the ditches. At the most, perhaps, microtextual level, then, Paradiso uh, and Purgatorio 18 also share references to horses. This is quote 16. Um, <clears throat> Which I, which I won't read. Um, so in, in Paradiso 18, Dante invokes Pegasus for inspiration. Um, and in Purgatory 18, uh, we, have a, we have another kind of horse, the languages of horses. Pad uh, Paradiso and Purgatory 18 also both frequently use words related to reason, affection, <coughs> desire, and thinking. So Beatrice tells Dante muta pensier in Paradiso 18.27. Um, and in Purgatory 18, Dante's thoughts are born, as we saw in quote 9. Um, connections between Purgatory 18 and Inferno 18, at the very micro level of, uh, of word, um, both Purg Purgatory and Inferno 18 use the related words grazia and grazia, albeit in much different contexts. In Inferno, Teresa's lover asks her if she finds favor with him, and in Purgatory, it's a reference to zeal. Um, turning grace green again, as we saw in that quote. In terms of images, both Paradiso 18 and Purgatorio 18 imply the colors red and white in reference to astronomical bodies. And this is in quote 17. Um, in Paradiso 1864, Dante travels from the red sphere of Mars to the white sphere of Jupiter, comparing, as we have seen, the image to the fading blush on a woman's cheek. Whereas in Purgatory 18, Dante sees the moon lit up as a burnished red, like a copper bucket. Presumably, it may have been white, more on a more regular basis. <laughs> Finally, if we assume a structural vertical symmetry, then we may posit further interpretive assertions. This is where I sort of had a little bit of fun with, um, with this new form of, of doing interpretation. Um, differences between each canto in some way conform to main differences between the canticles. I'll mention three ways. <clears throat> Firstly, if we think of some of the main topographical images associated with each canto, circling, descending, ditches in Inferno 18, um, in Purgatory 18, souls running in imitation of Mary, um, and talking about her running to the mountain, and souls as sparks of light flying around in the air making the shapes of letters and of an eagle in Paradiso 18, we are presented with quite apt although simplistic images for distinguishing between the canticles. In Inferno, souls are trapped in a downward spiral in the body of Satan. 
in purgatory of souls have the chance to purge themselves of sin and work their way up the mountain of purgatory. In heaven, souls fly around in the sky like birds flying in circles and in other shapes, singing in harmony with each other and existing in communion with each other. Similarly, in symmetrical contraposition with the ever-descending spirals of the Malabolge, the arcs of Dante's movement through heaven are described as ever widening circles, and this is in um, quote 18. E come per sentir più dilettanza bene operando, l'uomo di giorno in giorno s'accorge che la sua virtute avanza. Si ma corsi io che il mio girare intorno, col cielo insieme ave cresciuto largo, leggendo quel miracol più a giorno. My second point, if we assume that these um, three should be read um, in contrast with each other. The movements of the souls in all three cantos help define what is unique about each canticle. In Paradiso 18, the souls engage in a kind of beautiful dance, accompanying themselves in song. Whereas in Purgatorio 18, the souls are engaged in a more tedious and less musically entertaining work of purging sloth by running. And in February 18, the panders and seducers move in opposite directions, in descending circles, facing each other, as would partners in a dance. However, here, they face away from each other, uh, they face each other only to pass one another on their enforced march, slowly spiraling downward. The rhythm of the soul's movements is also imposed upon them, as Dante describes how the demons whip the souls to keep them moving, and in so doing, forces their heels to lift up in a kind of parody of dancing. Thus, in quite simplistic terms, we find a beautiful, intricate, flying, singing dance of souls in Paradiso 18, a parody of dance in Inferno 18, and a productive but unchoreographed kind of movement in Purgatorio 18, souls running in purgation of sloth. Thirdly, the numbers thematized in each canto demonstrate key differences between the canticles. In Paradiso 18, we hear a chorus of many voices coming from Mille Luci, the thousands of lights darting through the sky and forming the shapes of letters. When the lights form the shape of the eagle, the eagle begins to talk in one voice. Thus we have, characteristically for heaven perhaps, many voices singing together, the one and the many, and the many and the one. In addition, we see an emphasis on the process of enumerating letters and on um, combining numbers in mathematical operations. So he says, five times seven as opposed to just telling us there are 35 letters in the saying. In Purgatorio 18, we find a strong emphasis on the number two, as emphasized by several commentators. For instance, critics have argued that the canto begins in a Socratic way, with Virgil inviting Dante to speak, and vice versa, at which point Virgil's actual speech goes on to describe love in a more Aristotelian way. However, the dialectic between the travelers, which opens the canto, sets up the pattern of emphasis on the number two for the rest of the canto. Indeed, the souls guilty of sloth give the travelers two exempla twice. So two negative exempla of sloth and two exempla of its correction, zeal. Each time, one example is taken from classical literature and the other from the Bible. Thus, the canto focuses on the number two in order to emphasize the balance that all souls are trying to achieve in purgatory as well as perhaps to emphasize the nature and goal of love itself that requires two people and necessarily focuses on the self's relationship with the other. Finally, in Inferno 18, Dante specifies that there are 10 bolje. In addition, he emphasizes how Jason tripped and abandoned Hypsophile, leaving her soleta, thus in a way emphasizing the number one. And this again might be another stretch, but I'll just mention it. Um, Gisela Bella, who was pimped out by her brother to the Marquis d'Este, was afterwards left by him, so that she too was abandoned in a way and left alone, perhaps in a way that her name, given the fact that Sola may be found in its center, reflects of Gisela Bella. Thus, Inferno 18 emphasizes the number one and the number 10, Purgatorio 18 the number two, and Paradiso 18 a plurality of numbers, seven, five, 35, thousands, etc. These contrasts between our three contours to do with movement, number, and topography may help justify our project of reading vertically, but they also may simply reinforce the notion that each of Dante's canticles is individually coherent. Perhaps each canto and inferno would reflect in some way the isolation of each soul and this entrapment in a distorted body. Perhaps each canto of purgatory would reveal an acknowledgement of the canticle's main themes of production, productive purgation, 
interaction with other souls and with one's loved ones on earth, the necessity for struggle, prayer, repentance, communication, and so forth. Perhaps each contour of heaven would reveal a dazzling plurality of images and number and voices harmonized yet distinct, plural yet unified in God's love. However, even if this were the case, perhaps one of the clearest ways to see these distinctions is precisely through juxtaposition, and perhaps that, that's why we're doing this vertical project. In any case, I want to thank Heather and George for organizing this and having the courage to follow through on something in the spirit of Dante's work themselves, which is so daring and so new. And I want to thank you for partaking in the experiment and for listening. Thanks.